The second lecture in our series is entitled The Poet Prophets of the Old Testament. And what I'm going to be arguing in this lecture is that we have to think of the prophets not as people who foresee the future, but people who see profoundly into the present. But I start with the question, what is poetry? We saw last week how Robert Louth wrestled with this question in connection with his claim that the books of the prophets of the Old Testament were written largely in poetry. We saw how he used the alphabetic psalms and similar compositions in the Old Testament to work out what a line of biblical Hebrew poetry was and how it was characterised by what he called parallelism. He established that biblical poetry did not rhyme. If it had metre, this was not recoverable, because how Hebrew was pronounced in biblical times had long since been forgotten. However, the phenomenon of parallelism was sufficiently evident for it to be a means of identifying Hebrew poetry, along with the fact that the vocabulary of Hebrew poetry and its syntax were very different from what was found in prose. Now, in today's lecture, I want to discuss the question, what is poetry?, from the angle of the philosophy of knowledge. And in this I'm deeply indebted to the work of a German philosopher, Geert Volant, and to his book Philosophie der Dichtung, Philosophy of Poetry. I begin with the following statement, quote, The universe began with a big bang, since when the universe has been expanding. End of quote. Two questions arise. What does this statement mean, and in what sense is it true? The meaning of the statement depends on the fact that it belongs to the language of cosmology and fits into physical descriptions of the nature and origin of the universe. Whether or not it is true, depends on the findings of astronomers and physicists, the interpretation of these findings, and their formation into a theory that says that the universe began with a big bang that has caused the matter that makes up the universe to continue to accelerate away from the point of origin. However, it has to be added that anyone who accepts or advocates this theory must add the phrase to the best of our knowledge. It may be that further research will modify or even disprove this theory. After all, the Big Bang theory is comparatively recent. I'm old enough to remember that before the Big Bang theory, the generally accepted view was that of Fred Hoyle and Herman Bondy, known as the steady state theory, rather different from a Big Bang. What this means is that there must always be a provisionality about scientific statements. They must always leave open the possibility that further research will modify or disprove them. The same is true of historical statements. It may be claimed that by letting Lenin return to Russia in 1917, the Germans were responsible for the Russian Revolution. Historians could challenge this by saying that it is too simplistic, or that the revolution would have happened without Lenin, or that it might merely have taken a different form. Poetry is quite different from scientific and historical statements. Take the following lines composed by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. When evening's dusty car crowned 
with her dewy star, steals o'er the fading sky in shadowy flight. On leaves of aspen trees we tremble to the breeze, veiled from the grosser ken of mortal sight. It is not immediately clear what this means, and interpreters might disagree. In other words, the poem is not located in language and forms of expression, such as that found in astronomy or physics, which give sense to such terms as Big Bang and expanding universe. Secondly, it would not make sense to add to the poem the phrase, to the best of our knowledge. There is no way in which subsequent research would be able to modify or disprove what this poem is saying. This feature of poetry is called by Gent Vorland, Abgeschlossenheit, completedness. It is not possible to add anything to a poem. It possesses a completeness, whether or not we consider it to be a good poem or a bad one. In this connection, Gerd Volant makes some interesting comments on drama as a form of poetry, noting that dramas such as Friedrich Schiller's Wallenstein, uh, that's three plays that he wrote about the Catholic general um, in the Thirty Years' War, or jo Johann Wolfgang Goethe's Egmont, uh, that's about a, a Dutch count living at the end of the 16th century. And of course, we could add to this the historical plays of Shakespeare. These dramas share with poetry this fact of completedness. Schiller, Goethe and Shakespeare may well have made historical mistakes. We think of Shakespeare's portrayal of Joan of Arc as a sorceress in Henry VI, part one. But it is not the task of those who produce such dramas on the stage to try to correct the historical mistakes that they may contain. And in any case, such corrections will themselves be liable to correction in the light of further research. The meaning of poetry is imminent or self-referential, that is, it does not have to appeal to anything outside of itself to give it meaning or significance. Now, the next important feature of poetry from the angle of the philosophy of knowledge is poetry as a way of thinking. That poetry is a way of thinking is emphasised by Geert Vorland. He writes, and I quote, in poetry, things are done and felt as in the primary world. The poem, in its referential sense, is thinking in the strict sense, end of quote. It is important to consider how poetic thinking differs from empirical thinking. In empirical thinking, we organise the sense impressions that come in upon us from the world around us in binary or digital ways. Language, which plays a vital part in this process, is, as we know from general linguistics, itself a binary system. We organise the world into categories of opposites, dark, light, near, far, heavy, light, easy, difficult. Indeed, when we learn a new foreign language, it's often useful to begin with the words denoting opposites, such as this, that, here, there, up, down, entrance, exit. It's not generally appreciated that we have an excellent example of binary thinking in the opening chapter of the book of Genesis, where God separates light from darkness, day from night, creatures that fly from creatures that crawl, the earth from what is under the earth, and so on. 
Now, poetic thinking is not binary in this way. Although poetry uses language, which functions, of course, on binary principles, and draws upon the objects of our everyday experience of the natural world for its subject matter, poetry combines these things together in ways which depend upon the individual imaginative genius, or lack of it, of the poets themselves. There is a splendid passage in Robert Louth's fifth lecture which sums up how the poetic genius takes the objects of the world and forms them into something quite different. I quote here from the English translation of Louth. The whole course of nature, that immense universe of things, offers itself to human contemplation and affords an infinite variety, a confused assemblage, a wilderness, as it were, of images, which being collected in the materials of poetry are selected and produced, as occasion dictates. The mind of man is that mirror of Plato, which, as he turns about at pleasure and directs to a different point of view, he creates another sun, other stars, planets, animals, and even another self, in this shadow or image of himself which a man beholds when the mirror is turned inward towards himself, he is enabled in some degree to contemplate the souls of other men. End of quotation. In other words, poetry depicts the world around us in such a way as to create new perspectives in which familiar things appear differently, Things unconnected are brought together. Meaning is imparted to what may seem pointless. And in all this, the human understanding of the world is changed and may be changed in such a way that behaviour and attitudes are affected. What we might loosely call the spiritual comes into view in a way which may not be conveyed by empirical binary thinking. One thing that is affected, and this is important for the present series of lectures, is how time functions in poetry according to the philosophy of knowledge. In empirical thinking, time, divided into present, past and future, is an organising principle of our experience of the world around us. In poetic thinking, it is different. The past and the future relate to the present by giving meaning to the present, often by way of critique. It can criticise the present by depicting a past that was a golden age now lost, or it can speak of a future coming new or golden age that will fulfil the disappointed hopes of the present. In both cases, it may inspire people to work to improve the present in the light of the poetic descriptions of the past and the future. Volant remarks that in poetry, the future gives meaning to the present and that it does not matter whether that future comes to be realised or not. Poets are not so much people who see into the future, they see into the present with insight that is special to them. Now this matter must be explored further with regard to the prophets of the Old Testament because if what I'm saying is right, if they were poets, it was not so much that they saw into the future but into the present. And if what Voland has said is correct, it does not matter whether what the prophets may have said about the future came to pass or not. Yet in Christian tradition, certainly, the most important thing about the prophets is that they are believed to have foreseen the future, to have foreseen the coming of Christ, 
Indeed, one of the standard Christian arguments for the inspiration of the Bible was that it contained a pattern of prophecy and fulfilment. Now, the Christian belief that the Old Testament prophets foresaw the coming of Jesus and his death and resurrection, this belief rests, in fact, upon hindsight, upon the fact that it was Jesus himself who interpreted his work in terms of Old Testament passages in the prophetic books, and that he did so in a way that no one had done before. It must be stressed that this understanding of Jesus' mission was unique to himself. The reason why his followers and opponents did not understand who he was and what his mission was was because no one reading the Old Testament scriptures at the time of Jesus read them in the way that he did. My late friend and dear colleague from Durham days, Professor Kingsley Barrett, made it clear in a masterly essay on the use of the Old Testament in the New Testament that this use was quite unique to the Judaism of the time of Jesus and that this unique understanding of the Old Testament can only have come from Jesus himself. In Luke 24, 25, the risen Christ expounds to the two disciples on the Emmaus Road from the scriptures, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, quote, the things concerning himself, unquote. When the early church look back to the Old Testament scriptures from the hindsight of the mission of Jesus, they saw naturally that it could be understood in terms of the scriptures. I would want to say that this was not because the prophets foresaw Jesus, but because the poet prophets spoke of their own present in such a way that they expressed profound insights that guided Jesus' his own ministry, although he was the only person who knew this at the time. Now, but what you might want to ask about the Old Testament itself, surely did the Old Testament not regard its prophets as foretellers of the future? The answer is that the prophets were certainly sometimes associated with what we would call foretelling the future or soothsaying, but that increasingly the idea that prophets were forecasters of the future became, became so problematic that it was rejected. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, Saul, who is looking from, for some lost asses, is advised to consult a man of God who has the reputation that what he says comes true. The comment is added that he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. However, there are several incidents in the Old Testament which struggle to address the problem of how you tell a true prophet from a false one if the nature of prophecy is to foretell the future. In 1 Kings chapter 22, 400 prophets who promise victory for King Jehoshaphat if he and his allies fight the Syrians at Ramoth Gilead are opposed by one prophet, Micaiah, who only predicts disaster and defeat. In Jeremiah 28, Jeremiah is directly opposed by another prophet named Hananiah. Hananiah predicts that God is about to defeat the Babylonians who have just taken into exile King Jehoiakim. He asserts that the king will be restored to the throne in Jerusalem and that the temple vessels that were taken to Babylon will be returned. This is in direct contradiction to Jeremiah's proclamation that no such imminent restoration is going to take place. There is a strange and intriguing incident in 1 Kings 13 that deconstructs, as we would say today, 
the whole notion of predictive prophecy. A prophet goes to the altar at Bethel and prophesies its destruction. King Jeroboam orders him to be seized, whereupon the altar is mysteriously torn down and the king's hand is dried up. At the king's entreaty, the prophet restores his hand and in gratitude, the king invites the prophet to come to his palace to be rewarded. The prophet refuses. God has forbidden him to eat or drink or to return home by the way that he came. Another prophet now chases after him and invites him into his house for refreshment. The first prophet refuses. God has commanded him not to eat or drink or to retrace his steps. The second prophet insists. He is also a prophet and has been commanded by an angel to bring the first prophet to his home for refreshment. So the first prophet gives in and goes to the house for refreshment and while they were eating, the prophet who is providing the hospitality receives a word from God denouncing the first prophet for disobeying him. The prophet sets off after the meal and is met and killed by a lion because of his disobedience. The passage points up the problem of how to know whether a prophet is speaking truly from God or whether he's not. And it is no accident that in one of the last books of the Old Testament, in Zechariah chapter 13, 3, we find the following passage, ironically enough, in a prophetic book. I quote, I also will remove from the land the prophets and the unclean spirits. And if anyone again appears as a prophet, his father and mother who bore him will say to him, you shall not live, for you speak lies in the name of the Lord. If the Old Testament itself found the idea that prophecies were primarily forecasters of the future problematic, how are we to proceed? We do so by going back to Jesus. As I said earlier, it was a standard part of Christian proof that the Old Testament was inspired, that what the prophets had foreseen had been fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. Most of us will be familiar with Handel's Oritire, Oritario Messiah, but will not realise the political and theological point that the libretto was trying to make. In the 18th century, while Robert Louth was arguing that the Old Testament prophets were poets, the Old Testament was being bitterly attacked by Christian radicals we call deists. They argued that the Old Testament is a barbaric book, which should not be part of a Christian view of reality. And this was not only an attack on the Old Testament, it was an attack on the established Church of England. The Church of England had been reformed by Henry VIII and Edward VI, and their right to carry out this reformation as kings had been justified by appeal to the Old Testament, to the examples of King David, who organised the temple worship, and Kings Hezekiah and Josiah, who had reformed the temple worship when it became corrupted. To attack the Old Testament was to attack the established church, and one of the purposes of Handel's Messiah was to defend both the Old Testament and the established church by showing how the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah had been fulfilled in Jesus. This is why Messiah begins where it does, with the voice crying in the wilderness in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1, a passage that relates directly to the ministry of John the Baptist at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. Now, it is necessary for us to turn all this reasoning upside down and to say that it is not the Old Testament prophets who validate Jesus, it is Jesus 
who validates the Old Testament prophets. Jesus needs no validation. He exemplifies what St. Paul calls the foolishness of God, in which the cross is folly to Greeks and a stumbling block to Jews, but salvation to those who believe. Christians accept in faith that Jesus is the servant of God and the Son of God. But if Jesus validates the prophets by seeing his own mission in terms of their words, he validates them not as foreseers of the future, but as poets who understand the present in such a profound way that their insights are valid for their own times and for future times and places. It will be one of my contentions in these lectures that Old Testament scholarship has devoted far too much time to trying to date the Old Testament prophets and prophecies precisely and have paid far too little attention to what they say about the timeless and eternal present which embraces our own present also. I want to quote three passages from a book by Friedrich Gundolf that he wrote about the German poet Stefan Georger, whose dates were 1868 to 1933. And Gundolf belonged to this inner circle of Georger's uh, followers. And Gundolf's book is a work of art in itself. And it claims powerfully that Georg was a prophet in the sense that is being argued in this lecture, that is, someone who saw profoundly into the present. In the first quotation, Gundolf was replying to a criticism of Georga, a criticism that could be applied equally to the Old Testament prophets, that Georga's denunciations of what he regarded as ugly and blind and deforming in the society of his day was simply disillusionment. It was not disillusionment, argued Gundolf, but was born of a vision of hope that Georga entertained. And here I quote from Gundolf. The negative judgments of Hölderlin and Nietzsche, two German poets, are misunderstood when they are taken to be the complaints of malcontent. All curses and denials of prophets take their meaning from an unconditional yes demanded by the appearance of a new God. Without meaning to, each yes entails a no. Each eternity necessarily creates mere time. Every beginning an end. Every space limits. Every height a depth. But it is the prophets, those who proclaim new gods, i.e. people of the turning point, whose yes is at the same time reproof and judgment and appears to a self-satisfied generation to be no more than deniers as long as their new God, their new yes, is not recognised. End of quote. And that resonates enormously, I think, with uh, many of the statements of the Old Testament prophets. The second quotation concerns Georgi's remarkable poem, the Antichrist. And here, Gundolf compares Georga to the writer of the book of Revelation when he refers to the vision from Patmos. His summary of the poem is itself a powerful piece of poetic writing, arguably even more powerful than Georga's own diagnos diagnosis of the corrupting power of evil in society. Gundolf wrote 90 years ago. But if what he wrote sounds uncomfortably relevant to today's world of post-truth and post-facts, this is because it is prophetic. That is, it speaks of a present that is eternally being judged. This is a quotation from Gundolf. The Antichrist is the gigantic final form 
of a secularized national life that perverts every truth, soothes every anxiety, and sucks the blood from every kind of reason. The falsifier, the dazzler, the ensnarer, the misuser, the confuser, the prince of vermin, who makes what is difficult pleasant and cheap for everyone, who corrupts what exists, perverts the arts, bends the standards, falsifies what is true, the demon of corruption, the herald of disaster, hedged between flabby nature and lustful spirit, the abolition of Christianity, the degenerate spirit and world of souls has found here a mighty unveiling, as in the vision from Patmos, of the fall of the heathen world of blood and sensuality. This poem alone would put Gyorga in the ranks of the great prophets. It has nothing to compare with it for its visionary flight, its dark greatness, its plastic energy and thundering distance." End of quote. And the final quotation from Georga is again one that can be applied to the Old Testament. Nations are first created by gods. This has been known by every seer from biblical times to Holderlin and has named the god together with the nation. Such a seer feels the coming fate of the nation most intensely, for in the new God everything is there that he brings and demands. Being a seer is only the present receiving of his outpouring light, which only reaches the darker, distant places later. It is less a seeing in advance of what will happen in the future, and more of an immediate discerning of what is already on its way. So I have been arguing that poet prophets do not see the future, but rather the present, but the present as time eternally present. But there is one more question to be asked. Do the poet prophets see in the present that is eternally present, an eternity beyond time? Is their view restricted to the world of time and space? Or do they see and grasp, and are they grasped by a reality that is beyond the world of time and space? Perhaps it is no accident that when St. Paul tries to describe the secret and hidden wisdom of God in 1 Corinthians 2.9, he quotes a fragment of Hebrew prophetic poetry from Isaiah 64.4. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We note the parallelism of the three lines we note that from the standpoint of empirical thinking, Paul says nothing. He makes three negative statements. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nobody has imagined. Yet from the standpoint of poetry, the fragment says a great deal. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. The fragment says a great deal, and it does so by invoking what we may call the sublime. The sublime can be thought of in the first instance as the human reaction to phenomena of nature, such as an amazing sunset, a massive waterfall, the grandeur of snow-capped mountains, that make an overwhelming impression upon observers. We are not able to grasp these experiences with the binary mechanisms of thought and language that I mentioned earlier. For this reason, they may make us react with fear or with awe and wonder. They may make us aware of our own significance as human beings. They may make us aware of our mortality, 
and by stripping away our self-confidence and self-sufficiency, the experiences may make us sense the eternal and may give us intimations of an unseen world to which, in a mysterious way, we may feel that we belong. That there is a link between poetry and the sublime has been observed since the writings of a first century AD unknown writer named for convenience Longinus. And there is a reference to Longinus and the sublime in Louth's 14th lecture. There he links the sublime with passionate outpourings of Hebrew poetic compositions. For our purposes, we can say that sublime poetry is an attempt to express in words the overwhelming impression made by experience of the sublime, experience that can strip us of our certainties and make us contemplate realities beyond our world of time and space. In the Bible, the supreme example of this is in the final chapters of the book of Job, where God speaks to Job out of a whirlwind and puts before him not only the awe-inspiring phenomena of the world of nature, but also some seemingly trivial instances. Confronted with the sublime, Joan Job confesses, I quote, I have heard of thee with the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee, wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Perhaps I can add that in today's world, if we see, for example, a great waterfall, such as the Rheinfall in Schaffhausen, what do we do? We photograph it. Earlier generations would have tried to paint it, or perhaps have tried to express the experience in poetry. But it is not only the sublime that can have this effect upon us. Beauty can act in the same way. And there is a remarkable passage in the didactic novel by the 19th century German philosopher Jakob Friedrich Fries, entitled Julius and Evagoras, which expresses this fact. Fries was a profound student of Immanuel Kant and sought in his own writings to go beyond Kant, especially in the area of aesthetics. For Fries, Experience of the beautiful is experience of eternal values of truth and harmony, and such experiences can best be captured and described in poetry. And here I have a quote from Julius and Evagoras. The power of beauty in the life of man ought to awaken our intuitive awareness of the ideas of the eternally true essence of things. An intuitive awareness or presentiment which animates faith within the sphere of human knowledge. In addition to the ordinary view of things, which is based on understanding, there is within our spirit yet another view of the world, a higher and transfigured view of the world which belongs to religion and beauty. This transfigured view of the world has, in the idea of beauty, its own higher right to truth, so to speak. This truth is distinct from the truth of the understanding which dominates the sciences. The truth of beauty is the torch which lights the man inspired with enthusiasm, is the torch which lights the man of devotion, and all those who dedicate or strive to make the sacrifice of their temporal existence to eternal ideas. Poets then, encountering in the sublime and the beautiful intimations of an eternal world, give expression in their poetry to these intuitions that enable us to see in their work not only profound understandings of the present, but intuitions of what lies beyond time and space. It will be my task in the fourth lecture to defend and illustrate this 
by interpreting the so-called servant songs in the later chapters of the book of Isaiah. Next week, I shall talk about the Old Testament prophets as performers, how they delivered their messages in public, and why it is, therefore, that they come down to us to be able to speak to our times. <laughs>